Listen, Count. Navigating the psychological landscape of long-term investing is as crucial as financial savvy. Emotional biases like fear, greed, and overconfidence can skew decision-making, impacting investment strategies. Recognizing these biases is key to overcoming them. Warren Buffett's advice, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful, highlights the importance of counteracting herd behavior and emotional biases. It's about making decisions contrary to market sentiment. Understanding one's psychological profile is vital. Are you prone to herd behavior or loss aversion? Recognizing these tendencies can lead to more rational decisions. Market psychology also influences investment choices. Collective investor sentiment can sway markets, but focusing on long-term goals and maintaining discipline is essential. Financial advisors can play a crucial role in helping investors manage psychological biases, leading to more effective decision-making. Doc G, how do you suggest that people kind of master their emotions and not be their worst enemy when it comes to compound growth and compound interest? I think it's really a time you have to ask yourself those difficult questions. And if you're finding that you cannot stomach the ups and downs in the market, you really need to have a financial advisor who helps you with it. Um, but I also like what I pretty much get from Nick Majuli. He wrote a book called Just Keep Buying. And I, I love the philosophy. The truth of the matter is most markets go up over time. If you just keep buying, especially when you're young, you're going to do just fine. In up markets, you buy. In down markets, you buy. If you just keep buying over long periods of time, that compound interest is going to fix most of your mistakes. And so that's really the key is especially when you're young, especially when compounds, compound interest is on your side, just keep investing. Mariko, last time you were here, you talked about needing a fireman mentality or having a firefighter's mentality where when the building's on fire, you have to be willing to run in when everybody else is running away. Yeah, not everyone's wired for that, but but um, you know, and I think that speaks to something that Michael had had spoken to, which is that when you have an asset class that everyone hates, um, that's usually uh, you know an interesting time to to explore and, and do work on it. And I think this is where rebalancing comes in when you have a diversified portfolio in different asset classes, and over the course of a year, some some pieces will really outperform and some will be dogs and uh, taking some of your profits in those, you know, to keep it in rebalancing it back, you're reinvesting it in the asset class that's underperformed. Um, you know, usually that asset class, the reasons that cause that asset class to underperform change and there's mean reversion and that asset class starts to do better. I once had uh, an institutional client who would rebalance uh, every I think it was every month. That was unusual. Yeah, Most institutions cool. would rebalance every, you know, once a year or something. Uh, but they would rebalance every month. And I have to tell you, like when we were had a had a time when we were underperforming relative to our benchmark, you know, it was really great to have money coming in that we could deploy when it was a really good time for us to deploy. And because you do want to buy things when you know you want to buy low and sell high. Right? And unfortunately, the times that you you can buy low are usually not the times you feel like buying low. Right? So it was really, I mean, they were very disciplined about rebalancing. And I think, I think, um, you know, our, our natural human wiring is we're going to want to put stuff in the stuff that's working. And if you can get excited about putting money where the stuff's not working, as long as it's a real asset class, you know, right? not like crypto or Beanie Babies, uh, you know, that, 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 that you get excited when you, you know, find a great pair of shoes and they're 40% off and you really love them and they look great on you. Like, can we feel that way about, about, you know, asset classes as well? So I think having rebalancing, which is automatic, um, also takes away some of the emotion because then your self-concept is I'm that person who's a disciplined investor. I automatically invest. I, I'm investing all the time. I rebalance once a year. Um, and, and that's because I'm a disciplined investor. 
And that way, you know, it's it's part of your self-construct that the things that you do are the things uh, that reflect who you are. Um, and if you can really embed some, you'll have some good investment habits. And then the psychology piece will become less likely to kind of destabilize you, I think, you know, if you really work on that self-concept. Helene, were you saying earlier that talking about this time is different? I think one of the risks when it comes to this concept of compounding is that there is a real, um, th there's a temptation that people want to compound faster. And that's why when something like crypto comes along and you, you have people entering early in a cycle where they're growing their money exponentially, like in 12 months, suddenly they say, oh, I can compound my money in 12 months. I don't have to wait 30 years. But those who are experienced investors have seen that it tends to be the boring investments that do well in compound. And oftentimes, things that go up quickly also come down quickly. Right. I mean, what I would say is, is it's almost the flip side of the person who invests too conservatively, who keeps their money, you know, in a savings account or in a two percent interest investment for decades, you know, because they're afraid of making a mistake or they're afraid of the loss. It's the complete opposite side of this, which is the person who thinks they're going to outsmart all of this and that they're going to jumpstart this and they're going to accelerate it. And it's equally as delusional, frankly, um, though, of course, there's always some success story out there somewhere. So it gets held up as the exemplar when, in fact, it should be the reason you know it is because it's man bites dog. You know, most people who do this are not going to make money. The vast majority of dot com people lost money. The va it appears to be true as well, from what we can tell from the crypto crowd and the mean stock traders. Um, I'm sure it'll take a year or two to really come out. But the other thing I do want to say is that it's really important to just stay focused on the long term. One of the things, because I write about this, I will often hear from people, you know, in 2008 when Lehman crashed or, you know, it, when COVID happened. And the, 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 what I always try to explain to people is not only do you have to sell at the right time, you need to buy back in at the right time. And the chances of you doing both of those things are just about nil. And that's true for professional investors. And that's true for you. And I find that that's one way to actually convince people to stick it out and to work past their fear because they're even more fearful of making the wrong decision on the other end. And that will, that will lead to a, it's almost like making paralysis work in, in your, in your long-term favor in this case, just stay put. You're not going to guess it right the second time. You've probably not guessed it right now because it was really the right time to sell three weeks ago, like before this happened. <laughs> so I, I, I do find that that actually kind of works as a way to explain it to people. You've got to guess it right. Um, the stat is, and you will know it better than me, it's, you know, it's an, it's an infinitesimal number of days of the year that account for most of the gains in the stock market. And if you miss those days, you've missed most of the gain for the year. And so pulling in and out is just not a really good idea. And I and find those days usually, oh, sorry, yeah. Helene, those and things usually those happen in the toilet when the market is just, blood is running in the streets. Mm -hmm. That's when those days happen, yeah, right. when you're least likely to actually be there. Right. And, and like you said, Mariko, I mean, you know, it's instinctual to want to do this. It's, it's very instinctual to want to pull out, to want to seek safety, and conversely, not to invest. And it's just it's just really hard to get people to overcome that fear sometimes. And, you know, yes, it's, you know, paralysis helps sometimes. Um, sometimes working with a financial advisor helps. Sometimes just talking it through with a friend helps. Um, you know, but the point is, is that it just needs to be, you know, hammered in. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Valuable advice. Let's go to the last segment, segment five.